This next series by Christopher Love has to do with the mortified Christian, and uh, there are ten sermons in this series. The text is Romans 8:13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Romans 8:13. Sermon 1, the text opened. Moses said to Israel in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. This is the sum and scope of the subject I am now to treat, a treatise that may not only invite, but crave your serious attention and consideration for they are matters of great concern of life and death. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. The chapter out of which my text is taken contains in it the great charter of a Christian, wherein are enrolled the many privileges of believers. And yet among them, here and there, are mingled and interspersed many fearful threatenings and denunciations. Among these, one is in my text. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. I shall not stand long upon the explication of the words, as they are very plain and obvious to the weakest capacity. If you live after the flesh. All men who are alive live in the flesh, but no man should live after the flesh. To live after the flesh, that is, after the sinful motions and corrupt dictates of nature, implies these three things. First, continuance and constancy in a way of sin. It is not said if you do after the flesh you shall die, for the best of God's children do. Yet they do not live after the flesh. They do not make a trade of sin. To live after the flesh signifies a continued act of sin. Second, it notes not only constancy and continuance, but also complacence and delight in sin. Men are wont to rejoice in life, and so to live after the flesh implies a delight and complacency in sin. Third, it implies a great deal of industry and labor in the ways of sin. It is one thing for sin to follow after you, and another thing for you to follow after sin. The Apostle says in Galatians 6.1, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one with the spirit of meekness. Sin runs after a godly man and overtakes him, but a wicked man runs after sin and overtakes sin. It is one thing for corruption to dog you, and another thing for you to run after sin and satisfy the desires of the flesh and of the mind. To live after the flesh denotes constancy, complacency, and industry in the ways of sin. The corrupt dictates and motions of the body are called flesh for these reasons. First, because sin is in the flesh as well as in the spirit. The members of the body are corrupt as well as the soul, James 4.1. Second, because sin is naturally as dear to a man as his own flesh, and hence it is compared to the right eye and the right hand. And third, because sin is acted out by the flesh, and that being the instrument of acting out sin, it is called by its name. Sin was in us as soon as we put on flesh, and it will be in us as long as we live in the flesh. As David says in Psalm 51, 5, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Sin will remain in us as long as we live in this world. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Die. That is good news. It would be well for a man who takes his swing in sinful delights and pleasures that he might die like a beast. There might be an end of him. But this must not be understood as if the soul should die eternally. But you shall die, that is, you shall incur damnation if you live after the flesh. Objection. Some may ask how the apostle could say that those who live after the flesh shall die, or as the damned in hellfire shall live in those torments perpetually. Mark 9.44 Answer. 
though the wicked shall live in hell. Their damnation is called a death for two reasons. In scripture phrase, that does not deserve the name of life that does not bring comfort with it. And the scripture expresses a doleful and dismal estate by the name of death. Also, it is called death because these persons are estranged and separated from God, who is life. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You may sin by your own strength, but you cannot mortify sin, but by the strength of the Spirit. Mortify the deeds of the body means to keep under and subdue the power and predominance of sin. If you mortify the deeds of the body, that is, those sins that are acted in the body, then you, shall have, then you shall live, not everlastingly here, but you shall live forever in heaven and you shall be saved. This is that indispensable condition upon which God has entailed salvation. If you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Now, having thus opened the words, I once more say to you, as did Moses to Israel, Behold, I have set before you this day blessing and cursing, life and death. Therefore choose life, which you will have. I have set before you life. If you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And I have set before you death. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Therefore choose whether you will be saved or damned, whether you will live or die. The great scope of the Apostle in this chapter is to stir up and press believers to walk as ones worthy of their justification. Though Christ does all for us in point of justification, we must do something too. Though Christ justifies us from the guilt of sin, we must labor to be freed from the filth of sin. This exhortation the Apostle presses upon them by three arguments. First, Romans 8:12. Brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. No, we are debtors to the Spirit to live after the Spirit. We are indebted to God to mortify our sins and corruptions, and it's a part of equity and common honesty to pay what we owe. He presses it upon them by the sad consequence of their not walking as worthy of their justification. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. And third, he presses it presses them to it by the great benefit and advantage that will redound to them upon the performance of this duty. If you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Before I come to the distinct handling of the words and insist upon those points I intend principally to speak of, I shall, from the general view and aspect of the text, draw out eight doctrinal considerations so that you may see the strength of the text and how many observations this short text will afford. I will only name them. Consideration one, this is drawn from the consideration of the persons to whom Paul wrote. They were not wicked men only, such as were in a state of paganism, unbelievers, but those who were in a converted state, true believers. To these, Paul uses this denunciation. From whence I note doctrine one, denunciations and threatenings are to be pressed upon converted as well as unconverted men. It is observable that the word of God is not only compared in 1 Peter 2, 2 to milk, which is of a pleasant taste, but it is likewise compared to salt in Colossians 4, 6. For the godly have a great deal of rottenness and corruption in them which must be eaten out by the salt of the word, and they thereby are kept pure and spotless. Consideration two, the apostle not only preaches comfort to believers, justification to them, that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1, but he likewise preaches threatenings to them, from whence observe doctrine two, doctrines of terror ought to be pressed upon believers, as well as doctrines of comfort and consolation. Therefore, they only preach half the will of God, who only handle doctrines of comfort and never press men to duty and encourage men to the practice of godliness. Consideration three, the apostle not only preaches terror and denunciations, but he also joins these threatening doctrines of comfort. 
from whence observe further doctrine three when ministers preach doctrines of terror and condemnation they ought to mingle them with them doctrines of comfort and consolation Therefore, as they are to blame who always preach doctrines of comfort, so likewise they are blameworthy who never preach comfort. A variety of doctrines sets off a man's ministry with a, with a greater luster, beauty, and efficacy upon the hearts of the hearers. Consideration four, note the method the apostle uses here. He first preaches terror before he preaches doctrines of comfort. If you live after the flesh, you shall die, but if you through the Spirit to mortify the deeds of the body you shall live from whence we may observe this doctrine doctrine four when Christians grow sensual wanton careless and remiss in duties laying aside that holy watchfulness and care they were wont to have at such times as these doctrines of terror are more needful and necessary than doctrines of comfort Consideration five, this is drawn from the addition of the phrase in the text, through the Spirit. The former part of the verse does not say, if ye through the power of the devil do live after the flesh, ye shall die. But here these words are added, if you through the Spirit, from whence observe doctrine five, a man may commit sin by his own strength, but he cannot mortify sin, but by the help of the Spirit. A single man can as soon destroy a whole army of men with his own hand as subdue one sin by his own power. Any man may wound himself, but every man cannot heal himself. You may commit sin, but you cannot purge out sin. A man may easily run down a hill, but it is very difficult getting up a hill. A man may easily commit sin, but he cannot mortify sin except by the strength of the Spirit. Consideration six, if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, observe that doctrine six, in every regenerate man there are some deeds and reminders and relics of sin and corruption still left. Consideration seven, from the same phrase we may learn doctrine seven, Christians stand in need of mortification as well as other men. They have some unbridled passion or untamed affection or unruly lust that needs to be tamed as well as other men. Godly men need sometimes to be tamed and hampered and mortified as well as the worst of men in the world. Consideration 8, last, we may observe from these words this doctrinal conclusion. Doctrine 8, men may expect their condition in another world to be answerable to what their carriage and conversation is in this world. Are you a man who gives way to the vain and sinful desires and corrupt motions of your own heart? Let me tell you that as surely as you are alive this day, if you continue and go on in this course, you shall die, be damned, and be undone forever. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you are a man who labors to bridle and keep under your unruly lusts, and tamed, untamed affections, so that grace may get the victory over your corruptions, and so that sin may not rule and reign in your mortal bodies. You are on the ready way to obtaining life everlasting. Therefore I beseech you, my brethren, do not think or reason in this way with yourselves. If I shall be saved, I shall be saved, though I live never so profanely. And if I shall be damned, I shall be damned. Let me do what I will to the contrary. Do not argue this way, for here you see the scripture tells you expressly that if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. <clears throat> I have given you these eight doctrinal conclusions from the general scope and aspect of the words. I shall now draw out, these, uh, draw out three more doctrines which I intend to insist upon. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. From this phrase, observe doctrine one, living according to the world after the sinful motions and corrupt dictates of nature without laboring to mortify and subdue them is what will bring men to death and damnation. I add this phrase in the doctrine, without laboring to mortify and subdue them. Living after the flesh is put in opposition to mortifying the deeds of the flesh. 
If you live after the flesh without endeavoring to mortify and subdue the motions of it, this will bring you to death and damnation. Galatians 6, 8. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. By sowing to the flesh is meant following after the desire of the flesh, and such as do this shall thereby reap damnation. You who have your seed time in sin shall have your harvest in hell. You shall inherit damnation and hellfire forever. If you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. I shall speak to this doctrine only in this one sermon because my intentions are principally to insist upon the other branch of the text. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Therefore I shall only answer one query and then give you a practical use. Question. Some may say, if it is so that those who live after the flesh must die, then how may I know and be assured and satisfied in my own conscience that I am a man that I am a man who lives after the flesh and that sin is not subdued and mortified in my soul. Answer, I shall give you six general means how you may know whether sin is unmortified in you or not by your carriage both before and after the commission of any sin. First, by your carriage before the commission of any sin. When there is a longing and hankering desire in your soul to commit sin, and a studying and contriving how to act. Hereby the scripture describes an unmortified man. Psalm 36, 4, He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. When a man studies and, contri and contrives how to act out a sin and carry it out quietly and secretly, this is an argument. When upon such deliberate debates and rational consultations a man sets himself in a way that is not good this is an argument that he has an unmortified heart therefore if you plot study and contrive how to commit sin it is a strong argument that the power of sin is not subdued and mortified in you and second the corruption is unmortified in the soul when a man is more eager to commit the sin to which he is tempted than he is to resist it when a man is all on fire, as it were, and so eager in the pursuit of a lust to the satisfaction of which he is tempted, that he casts away all thoughts of resistance, this argues such a man to have an unmortified heart. A godly man who has the power of mortifying grace upon his heart may fall into the same sins as you do, yet he encounters them and takes more care how to resist sin than to act it out. Now, it may be, all your thoughts are taken up on how to satisfy your lust and commit this sin with secrecy, but not at all to resist it. And this is a sign of a very unmortified heart. And third, when men never vent and put forth their strength in prayer against these corruptions to which they are most subject and are assaulted with one sin one day and another lust another day and yet never go to God by prayer, to beg for strength and mortifying grace to resist and keep under these corruptions. This is a sign of an unmortified heart. In Psalm 51:15, David says, O Lord, open thou my lips. One observed from this that as long as David lay under the guilt of his sin, all that time his mouth was shut. He could not pray to God. And therefore, after he had confessed his sin, he begged God to open his lips so that he might show forth his praise. As long as your mouth is shut so that you cannot pray against your corruptions, it is a sign that sin is not yet mortified in you. Fourth, when corruptions and temptations to such and such sins most trouble and disturb you in holy duties, when a man is in an ordinance and a lust shall tempt him there and fill his heart full of wickedness and worldly-mindedness, when sin and corruption so seize your heart that you cannot tell what a minister says in a whole hour, this argues that you have a very unmortified heart. In Jeremiah 23:11, God says, In my house have I found their wickedness. When you give, give way to sinful thoughts and covetous imaginations in God's house, in the midst of holy duties, 
This discovers not only an unmortified, but a, a very impudent heart. The devil ravishes and deflowers you, even in God's presence. Many young men come to church to look after and gaze upon handsome women, to cherish their lusts and speculative wantonness. Take heed of this, for it is an argument that you live after the flesh when you give way to such sinful temptations in holy duties, when you should be attending God in his ordinances. Fifth, it is an argument that sin is unmortified in your heart when calling to remembrance your former sinfulness does not humble you, but rather stirs up your corruptions afresh in your heart to plot and contrive how to commit the same sins again. May be that you have been a drunkard in former times, and now you call to mind this sin with delight and study how to be drunk again. Or perhaps you were an old fornicator or adulterer, and now you remember it and contrive how to commit this sin again. This is a sign of an unmortified heart. Ezekiel 23:21. Thus thou callest to remembrance the lewdness of thy youth, in bruising thy teats by the Egyptians for the paps of thy youth. The children of Israel, by calling it to remembrance their adulteries in Egypt, fell again to their sinful pleasures. And sixth, when a temptation to sin is quickly and easily closed with, when you can commit a great sin upon a small temptation, when your heart is like gunpowder to a sin's touch, and it responds as did the young man whom the harlot met in Proverbs 7.22, it is said, he goeth after her straightway. This is a sign of an unmortified heart. Thus, I have given you six characters before the committing of sin of an unmortified heart. There are three characters more that I shall lay down of an unmortified heart after the commission of any sin. Character one, this is when you find more joy in the pleasure of sin after the commission of it than you do sorrow for committing it. When you have more joy in regard to the sweetness of sin than you have sorrow in the consideration of the evil of sin. Character two, when you cannot endure a reproof for any sin you have committed, this argues an unmortified heart. When men are like nettles, that if you touch them ever so little, they will sting you. So when you are told of your drunkenness or uncleanness or the like, you cannot let it go but rage, brawl, and wrangle. This shows that you are asleep and dead in sin. When you cannot endure a reproof, nor abide to be wakened out of it, when you cannot abide, it should be spoken against. It is a sign that you love sin well. James 1.19, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. When the word of God reproves you for a sin, you should be slow to wrath, not apt to be enraged at every reproof, but to receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save your souls. Verse 21, an unmortified heart is, is very ready to storm and fume and fret when he is reproved. Character three, when you take more care after the committing of a sin to keep it secret from the view and knowledge of men than to repent and be humbled for it in the presence of God, then you labor rather to hide it. When you labor rather to hide it than to repent of it. This proceeds from the predominance of sin and corruption in your heart. And thus I have given you nine discoveries of an unmortified heart. The Lord give you all grace to seriously inquire into your own souls whether you are mortified men and women or not. Use of reproof. The use that I shall make of this shall be of reproof. If it is so that those who live after the flesh shall die, then how blameworthy are all of you who incur this dismal judgment of eternal death, who rather than kill your sins, let sin kill your soul. It is reported of the basilisk that if you do not kill him, he will kill you. So it is here. If you do not kill your sins, your sins will be the death of your soul. Therefore, how blameworthy are you who would rather suffer sin to kill your souls than to take any pains to mortify and subdue your sins. I have read of a man who loved the fox so much that notwithstanding that the fox had pulled out the bowels of one of his children, he would not part with it. 
I fear there are many of you who harbor such ravenous lusts and corruptions in your hearts that will destroy your souls. Yet you will not part with them, but suffer them to rule and reign in you, never going to God by prayer to beg for mortifying grace to subdue and keep them under. Thus I am done with the first branch of the text. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. <clears throat> 